Hello, Washoe County Library System welcomes you to our monthly series from the Nevada Historical Society, presents High Noon with Neil Cobb. This afternoon's topic is about Nevada mining from silver and gold to copper and lithium, 170 years of development presented by Paul Franklin. My name is Samantha and I'm very happy to be here with you today. And now I'd like to introduce Sherry Hayes Zorn with Nevada Historical Society. Hey, thanks, Samantha. And as always, we really appreciate working with the Washoe County Libraries to provide this program to people all over the place. You know, it, we're, we've, we're really happy to be able to have this joint project to be able to share our history programming during COVID. And, and we've, what we've realized is kind of fun is how many people watch these programs once they're put onto the internet. And so we're reaching a much bigger audience. And so um, we hope you enjoy today's program. So I'm Sherry and I am the curator of history here at the Nevada Historic Society. And we wanna um, thank everybody for coming today, but I have to introduce our host, Neil Cobb, who is our honorary curator. And he's been a longtime supporter of the Historic Society since the late 80s. And he always does programming and, and supports the Historic Society and we truly appreciate it. So without further ado, let me introduce you, Neil Cobb. Hey, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Our speaker today, Mr. Paul Franklin has been an executive for the, in the semiconductor industry for some 50 years. During his career, he was instrumental in startups of five different companies, now retired, but still consulting to start tech companies. He is a frequent lecturer at the Stanford University. Much of his time is now focused on Western historical research Special, specializing in areas of mining and technology. He has published articles in the professional journals, has been a lecturer for UNR's OLLI, which uh, stands for Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, the Comstock Foundation, the Carson City Mint Museum, and he appeared on a local television program, Old Tales of Nevada, Past and Present. His first book, The Anatomy of an Ingot, follows the careers of three mining engineers and assayers who figured significantly in Nevada's early silver mining boom. Paul is presently finishing another book about a Comstock mining attorney who met with an untimely death at the end of a gun held by his mistress, who was a formerly the boarding house manager in Virginia City in the early 1860s. So please welcome Mr. Paul Franklin. Thank you, Neil. I want to just step aside a little bit and say thanks to Neil. He's uh, done a lot of uh, uh, introductions to me, for me, I guess, to different uh, forums, including Ali. Um, when one mentions Nevada to an outsider, the thoughts of Vegas, gambling, entertainment, atomic bomb testing, perhaps Reno and Lake Tahoe, and, and oh yes, mining. Actually, mining is number four today behind tourism, which is number one. Uh, logistics and warehousing, believe it or not, are number two. And uh, manufacturing is number three. Mining is four. Well, it wasn't always that way. Historically, in the good old Comstock days, it was number one. And I think the, uh, this next slide really does it for me. It, it captures the whole mining uh, scene, placer mining, a shaft there, uh, panning, a rocker, a sluice, and modest hydraulic. This is a colorized courier in Ives print. The techniques that were used initially were panning and they used more improvements such as the rocker that you see here. This allowed a lot more uh, sand and gravel from the river bo bottoms or the sluices uh, to be processed. The sluice was even a better 
uh, improvement because it could be as long as as uh, it needed to be to really efficiently separate the gold. There were riffles, little bars across the bottom, and they actually used mercury to capture the really fine gold as it was washed down the sluice. Now, these were the techniques that were present in California. And uh, the, the mercury, you, you remember, uh, for some of you remember using it as a silver amalgam for fillings in your dentist. They don't use it anymore. But anyway, the, the hydraulic mining uh, was really um, a good way to wash down a lot of uh, uh, ore. This was one that was the Molokov diggings. And you can see great big spouts of water. This was high pressure water coming from dams and sluices that carrying the water to the pipes. And it was a way to really process a lot rather than digging shovelfuls uh, of dirt. You wash this down the sluice like you saw in the be behind picture. Hard rock mining actually took over very early. Uh, the Mexicans and the Spanish used it in uh, Central America. Th th this is a picture of one with the Mexican miners called Tinateros with leather packs. And they did not have any climbing rope or anything. They went up these notched trees and poles, sometimes hundreds of feet underground, carrying the uh, uh, Zurons, which were the climbing things. And the, the, they may have had 50 to 60 pounds of ore in these. Not a nice job, but that was the early uh, hard rock mining. Now, hard rock mining took a, a completely more sophisticated turn in California and then in, Com in the Comstock. And let's get some terminology. There is not so, no such thing as really a mining tunnel or very rare. What a tunnel is really an opening at both ends. It, what it really is, is an adit. And, and an adit is a tunnel underground uh, leading off the shaft, typically, as you see in the drawing. Then you follow the vein, which uh, may be between a, a foot wall and a hanging wall, and that drift actually follows the vein, and that's where you start uh, mining the ore, bringing it to the shaft, and then bringing it up. Then the... Um, The head frame, which was the at the top of the shaft, was used for bringing up not only the ore, but also bringing the uh, miners up and down. And you can see there is a uh, motor at the end uh, that was in gear that was run usually by steam engine. You can get a better view for the this is a hoisting a double uh, hoisting engine. There's two drums in the next, uh, there's a picture of one in, actu uh, in an actual setting. The whole uh, combination of the hoist and the engine was typically housed uh, against the elements. A lot of those have, if you go through Virginia City, you'll see just the head frame. Most of the buildings have been uh, uh, destroyed or carried away. But the hoisting works with a steam engine housed in there to protect it from the env environment was the typical way they got out, not only the waste rock, which was the Spanish called Barasca, but the ore, the Bonanza ore. How did they get it out of the rock? Well, they had to blasted out and they used holes and into the solid rock drilled by single jacking. This is an example of one, a four pound hammer and you rotated this star drill. It had a, like a cruciform and that would be hardened steel. And you'd 
actually drill the hole. Actually, there was another way with two men, one with a eight to 12 pound sledgehammer. And uh, again, 90 degree twist. The guy holding the um, actual drill was uh, very, very uh, trustful of his partner because if he slipped, he would probably break his head or shoulder. Uh, by the way, note the candlelight in the back of this scene. And candlelight was the way they first operated. The candles were made from uh, a, a animal fat. It was processed to form a, a compound called stearin. Uh, they took the glycerin out of it. And this, this compound stearin really burned with a nice white flame and it lasted long and it was very clean burning. Here's a picture of some miners. You'll see uh, there's about four uh, actual candles there. The light provided for this picture was actually done using a magnesium flare. It certainly wasn't the light of the candles. Now, after drilling the holes, you would set dynamite in them. And in this picture, you can see there's about five holes close together in the center. And these don't have any fuses coming out of them. They were holes to basically allow the outer blasting uh, to crush the rock in. And then there was a, another ring of chargers that would basically throw it out so that the miners could start loading it up into a uh, ore bucket. Now, the blasting was first used was black powder, then dynamite in the 1870s, which tamed nitroglycerin. And then today, uh, you, you, you might have heard of ANFO, A-N-F-O, ammonium nitrate and fusel oil. That's the blasting agent that they use today. It's much safer and uh, it takes a, a reinforced blasting cap. Uh, to, to set it off. Now, once they got the ore up, they had to grind it. And the arraster was the old technique that the Mexicans used. And unfortunately, there was a mule or a horse or an oxen tied to this that would rotate the rocks around and uh, these big boulders to grind the ore. And that was a tedious process. Uh, but it was used in the Comstock. In fact, this is the Gould and Curry uh, refinery down at the junction of Six Mile Canyon and Seven Mile Canyon. And you can see the posts where they hitched the animals to and the round uh, circles. Now, the, they used uh, not only for grinding, but here they used it also for uh, extracting the gold and silver out of the ore. The way they did that was they added the ore into these uh, circles, and this was called the patio, uh, the, the circle process. And patio processing required mercury and a salt. It was usually a, a common uh, magistral or an iron copper sulfate act as a catalyst, and they'd tread horses or mules or oxen uh, and treading, mixing up all of this. Of course, needless to say, uh, these animals had a short life due to mercury poisoning. Now, to crush the ore at the Comstock, they used re really uh, the uh, stamp mill, which was actually first used in California in the 50s. And uh, these were actually used in medieval times, all the way back to the 1500s. Uh, but this, this was uh, a really noisy, and you had to use some power source. It was either run by steam or water power. For the Comstock, they used both. Down by the Carson River, they used the uh, river uh, water for power, and they used steam up above. Um, the, the refining, uh, uh, methods were either a, a gravimetric, you use gravity, solubility, oxidation or reduction, or hydrophilic. And, and I'll explain those as we go on. But this was the crushing end of it. 
And then you, you see inside the stamp mill, you, you can see the big belts uh, that were used to turn the cams. The cams would raise and lower the stamp mills and they'd crush the ore. The noise was deafening. I, I would imagine everybody had something stuffed in their ears in order to work there. But uh, the whole uh, Comstock region from Virginia City down to Silver City rang out with the boom, uh, the incessant boom of these stamp mills. <clears throat> Here's another picture of the Gould and Curry. They spared no expense. The first one in the early 60s was, cost $600,000, and it wasn't that efficient. Uh, later, uh, 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 techniques were made more efficient, but there was a lot of money that went into these stamp mills, and there were over 200 of them uh, in the Comstock region over the years. This is uh, the remains of one. This is one that was up in uh, Mill Canyon Road, if people know it. This is down 395 uh, by Golden Gate Road, midway between Colville and Walker. And it was beautiful. It was really a nice, there's a monument, Mac, uh, a monument plaque there. Unfortunately, a fire recently destroyed it, and that's what's left. You can see the writing on it. Uh, but you can see the stamp, the, those are the stamps coming out. And then at the top, you can see the cams that would rotate uh, and high, uh, raise and lower them. Um, the, the pan mill was the next step. After you ground up the ore, you use the pan mill for grinding the ore with mercury, salt, and copper sulfate. This was the technique at the uh, Washoe uh, pan process, they called it. And uh, you can see the pans and the mullers for grinding the mixture in this photo. This is a, a diagram of three different types of pans that were used, the Wheeler, Hepburn, and Peterson pan. And these were gradual improvements into the 70s. Uh, of course, you needed the engine uh, up on the Comstock, steam was the only way you had to burn wood. And, you know, wood was scarce. If you've been up on the Comstock, you've noticed there aren't that many trees. And the, the, the few pinion pines left are very small and, and not enough to fuel a, a big steam engine. So what they did was uh, they really relied on the uh, uh, mills down by the Carson River. This is the Morgan Mill, one of the ones in the beginning. And these were built right on down the Carson River to uh, Dayton. Uh, these were expensive uh, processing because they had to haul the mine from the mine, all the ore down to the Carson River. So that was one expense uh, that was later solved by a railroad. And we'll talk more about that now. The, the goal was found here uh, basically early in the 50s, and, and uh, it was Chinatown. There was also Mormons that came over, and uh, they actually uh, used uh, panning techniques in the Gold Canyon. Um, this is DeGroote's map, uh, just a blow up of the region there. You can just about make out. It says Gold Hill, and uh, you can you can see the uh, principal uh, mines: the Ofer, Gould and Curry, Central Mexican, Collar, Potosi, Savage, Imperial, and Yellow Jacket. Now, uh, the Mormons actually carried some of this gold back to Salt Lake City. They had an assay office, and it was called the Desiree Assay Office in Salt Lake, and they actually made coins in 1849. This was some of the first gold coins, private gold coins made. Um, very uh, uh, Towards the middle of the 50s, uh, two Grosch, uh, the two Grosch brothers, Alan and Hosea, actually discovered some silver up in near Silver City. Um, they, they located some claims there and above there, but they really uh, didn't recognize their uh, any rich silver uh, find from that because they both died, unfortunately. The original claimants 
uh, were O'Reilly, McLaughlin, Penrod, Finney, and Comstock, who the Comstock was named from. And these were the people that came after and later uh, usurped all the claims that the uh, Hosea brothers had. There's kind of an interesting story about the family trying to reclaim that, uh, but without any luck. Um, this is the guy that really assayed the first uh, uh, material from the Comstock. His name was Melville Atwood. He was in Grass Valley and he, he assayed it and found it was over $3,300 a ton. Now there was a second assayer a couple of days later, J.J. Ott in the neighboring city of Nevada City that also confirmed this assay. Very rich stuff. It turned out that uh, the uh, Gould and Curry was uh, really the first big mine where this uh, uh, assay came from. And um, it was the first uh, mine to be actually registered as a stock certificate. This stock certificate is, it says incorporated in June of 1860, and it was uh, authorized in uh, May of 63. Uh, the, the John D. Winters, there were three Winter brothers, the Joseph D., John D., and Theodore. And uh, John D. made sure that his brother, who actually uh, bought into the uh, first Comstock mine and distributed to the three brothers, they made out very, very well, by the way, as did uh, uh, this guy, uh, George Hurst who was a friend of Melville Latwood, the assayer. And uh, he and his partners, James B. Hagen and Lloyd Tevis in San Francisco, invested in many mines later on, including Pioche in Nevada, later the Ontario mine in Utah, the Homestake mine in Lead, South Dakota, and the Anaconda copper mine in Butte, Montana. How's that for investing? I wish I could invest in a, 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 a whole chain of successes like that in the stock market. All be proved to be incredibly rich, making Hearst one of the wealthiest men in the mining and in the United States. And he is of course the father of R William Randolph. About this time, all the ore was brought to San Francisco, believe it or not, for processing. This is a sign uh, uh, rather a, uh, an ad in a newspaper uh, in 1860, um, in July, it says Washoe and silver ores, um, lead ores and gold bearing. And this was by two uh, mining engineers, Bolsheimer and Kustel, both from uh, Hungary and uh, Germany who were educated over there. And they actually had a processing area and all the ore was carried over, believe it or not, to San Francisco. Now the shipping charges were $400 a ton and uh, oh, no, oh, about $400 a ton in refining and another 110 in shipping charges. So, but there was still a lot left for a nice profit because the ore assayed $3,300 per ton. So that, that was really well worth it. However, Coustel uh, really uh, looked at this and said, you know, what we really do need to do is put a, a, a refinery uh, over by the Comstock. And they, Coustel and Mosheimer actually built one of the first mills on the Carson River uh, right outside Dayton. Uh, by the way, Coustel was the authored the first book in the Nevada Territory. It was a book on silver and gold mining in the Comstock, a rare volume, if you can find it. Now, the Comstock at the time belonged to uh, the uh, Utah Territory. Uh, Brigham Young wanted uh, to actually uh, establish a state called Desiree, in, and uh, tried to do that during the Missouri Compromise of 1850. Congress didn't let them, but they gave them a big Utah Territory. And in fact, it was Utah Territory until 1861. Here is a actual Pony Express uh, stamp. Uh, it's stamped Gold Hill, Utah, Utah. So this was done in 18, early 1860 or, uh, or 1860. 
beginning of 1860 in March, when, when it became uh, Nevada territory. Um, the, uh, this is kind of a new map, thanks to Stan Pear, of uh, the first mining area. And you can see not only the uh, mines and in Gold Canyon, but also the Carson River Mills. It starts with the Mexican, Morgan, Brunswick, Vivian, Santiago, Eureka, Franklin, Woodworth, and Lyon. So um, this, this is the uh, way it looks today. You can actually hike up with the, uh, the Carson River and see the remains of a lot of these mills. The um, slides at the Carson or on the Carson River, this is the Rock Point Mill in Dayton. And uh, this is, you can visit this. It's one of the largest ones. And it was uh, built a little later in uh, 61. And it was owned by uh, a number of people. It was one of the largest mills in the country. And, uh, and the, it really later, I think in 1868 was owned by the Imperial Silver Mining Company. But a lot of the mines at this time were actually contracted out to independent mills to process their ore and recover the gold and silver. This is a map of the um, claims. And on the right, you have Virginia City going over towards Gold Hill, down towards the left lower corner, you can see the divide um, and up above that American city. Um, the, if you looked at a cross section of the mines through Virginia City and Gold Hill, those black areas would actually be what were called the stopes or the areas that they cleaned out the ore. And notice that there were some near the surface, but there were some also uh, uh, lower down. This represents two periods, actually about three, the early 60s and then uh, the late 60s in the mid range and then down here in the 70s. And this was the big bonanza uh, of the, uh, in Virginia City. Uh, now, the, remember we said the terminology was a hanging wall and foot wall. Here you can see a foot wall and a hanging wall and they actually put poles in, in, in between to make sure it's supported. And then they clean out the ore in between. Well, that didn't work too well on the Comstock. So a guy by the name of Dieter Scheimer uh, came up with this square set. It's kind of like Lincoln Logs, you put it together and that held up not only the ground from collapse, but then provided a place to put the barasca or the ore not the ore, but the waste rock and, and fill it up. So there's literally, literally a whole forest of um, uh, these timbers under Virginia City and Gold Hill. Here's a picture of what it looks like. Here's another diagram that was uh, in 1861 in, in and look at the, this is a, this is a picture of the uh, mill with, look at all the lumber outside of it. Now that lumber was used for the square set. And then the lumber on the left side was used for the uh, steam engine, which was later brought, and lumber was brought up for uh, purposes of generating steam. Where did all this lumber come from? It came from Tahoe. And the, this is a picture of Spooner Summit, for those of that you know, the, the whole side, uh, the east side of uh, Lake Tahoe was completely cleaned up. I mean, that's what it looked like. All the trees that you see up there are second growth. There's hardly any uh, primary <clears throat> first growth trees there. All of these trees went either for firewood or square set timbers for the mines. Now, this is uh, an, the, uh, the other areas in Nevada, you may ask, well, you know, was Comstock the only one? Well, no, there were, there were others. This is Aurora, 
which actually uh, they thought was in Nevada or in California early, but uh, a survey said, oh, nope, it's in uh, Nevada. And it's now a ghost town. And um, if you look at it today, um, it doesn't look like this. It's completely barren. I mean, all of these buildings are gone. There's a pile here on the Del Monte Mill and the Duran Mill and a few other little hillocks, but you would not recognize it. And it was a town of thousands of people in the eight, early 1860s. Uh, my dad and I treasure hunted with a metal detector in this town in the late 50s. That was before they cracked down on uh, archae archeological finds in these ghost towns in Nevada. Um, this is a map of actually Aurora and a sister city, uh, Esmeralda, and some of the buildings on it. And this was uh, the stock certificate of the Antelope Silver Mine. This was one of the big mines up there. And this was one of the earliest mines. Here's another stock certificate. This is the Esmeralda Consolidated Mine. This was incorporated in December, 1860. So this was a really early find. This was right after they found it. And, um, Humboldt was another area, by the way, just to the north of uh, Reno, where the, they found very early uh, gold and silver, and uh, it was known as the Humboldt District, and there were a couple of cities in there, Unionville, Star City, Oriana. Uh, here's a, surf, a stock certificate from one of the mines, uh, the whole Humboldt River Gold and Silver Mining Company in 1865. Now, there was a lot of growth. I mean, people came to, to these uh, <clears throat> mining areas. And if you look at a print of, this is a print that was done in 1861 by G.T. Brown, and it shows Virginia City, Gold, Gold Hill is down here. So you're looking up north. And these are the buildings that were in and around the town in 1861. Well. In three years later, in 1864, he came back and did another print. And this is Virginia City and Gold Hill. This is Mount Davis. Look at the size of the buildings now and the sophistication level. And this was in 64. Um, basically, this, that same print, by the way, shows that same center view. And then it shows the big mills that were around there in 1864. Here's a photograph about 18, the early 1860s, about 62, 63. And you can see the buildings are sh short, low to the ground. And here's one from the 1870s, the Bonanza type. Look at the buildings. Well, one of the guys responsible for this was um, uh, William Chapman Ralston. And um, he, he set up the Bank of California and he wanted a piece of the uh, action. And there, he had a partner, Darius Ogden Mills, uh, a very successful uh, Sacramento banker. And these were part of the bank ring. And they hired a guy, uh, William Ralston, who, um, I mean, excuse me, William Sharon. And they hired him basically to run the banking uh, uh, extension in Virginia City and then later Gold Hill. And uh, Sharon's recommendations was to monopolize the Comstock above and below the ground. That meant water, food, timber, transportation. He wanted to control every mine and mill. And by the way, he, they, <laughs> he just about did. And he had a spy who was an assayer and an, a mining engineer, C.A. Lockhart, who actually went in and, and told him which ones to uh, buy when the uh, mining activity went down. And, and he would buy it and then uh, they would revitalize uh, it when more mine, mining ore was found at deeper depths. Here's a check that uh, was made out to William Sharon, signed by William Sharon, for $50,000. By the way, $50,000 back then was like about $2 million today. 
it's nice to be able to write out checks to yourself. And he, the, you, he owned, along with the bank grain, the Union Mill and Mining Company. And what they did was buy up all of these mills when they were in deep trouble during a dry period when there was no, uh, no ore to mill and uh, the owners were deep in debt because they had financed this through the bank. This guy you recognize probably, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, he left Aurora. He was in Aurora in 1862, then went up to the ter territorial enterprise. He didn't stay long there. He got involved with a, uh, a potential uh, 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 duel, which never really ever came off. And then he traveled to California. But he wrote a book, uh, Roughing It, in 1872 that describes his period. And another person, um, Dan DeQuill, wrote another one, a close friend of Mark Twain at the Territorial Enterprise. Um, he wrote a book called The Ro Big Bonanza. Both are really, really uh, very good. And, and also um, uh, another source, Myron Angel's History of Nevada, which was written in 1881. These were the people that really, really made the Comstock famous. And so did Sutro. Al Adolf Sutro actually came down there. He ran a tobacco shop in San Francisco. Then he went to Washoe and he, uh, er, he started operating a mill and then a, and then a bank and an assay office. And then in later on the 60s, he proposed Sutro's Tunnel. And that was a long, long story. And uh, he had hired a guy by the name of uh, Ferdinand von Richthofen, Richthofen. and he, by, he was a noted mining engineer from Germany, and he basically uh, looked at it, examined it, and said, hey, this stuff is going to be found deeper. So in 1865, there was a lull in the ore, but he said, it's, you're going to find it deeper. So that basically uh, spurred Sutro to... Uh, go down from Dayton and dig these long four mile long tunnels up to the Comstock. And this is a stock certificate, Sutro Tunnel. And, uh, and then if you go down to there, uh, Sutro's Tunnel, you'll see there's actually four uh, tunnels and it, they go up uh, into, from Dayton into, uh, the main uh, uh, mining area at around the 1700 foot level. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of water down deep in these tunnels. So he was looking for the drainage of the Comstock so they could work the lower elevations or lower uh, depths. And then he also was looking at for ventilation. And transport of the ore down to the uh, mills down by Dayton and, and the Carson River. Well, that was really good, but he was going to charge a fee. Well, Sharon at the bank said, wait a minute, this guy's going to make a ton of money. We can't have that. And, you know, they were using very expensive pumps uh, to uh, the Cornish pump to get to the water. And, and you know, there must be another way. Uh, we could use the Cornish pumps, but ventilation and supplies to and from the mine, or I guess from the mine to the mill, and then wood up to the tunnels. He said, no, there's got to be another way. And that was the birth of the Virginia and Truckee Railroad. Sharon wanted to intercept Sutro's uh, uh, tunnel, and, and he resurrected this the idea of a railroad to ferry the ore and supplies to the Comstock mine. It was cheaper, uh, and it, it, it could be done fast, and he built it faster than Sutro could, could actually connect to the mines. This is a mining uh, stock that they put out, or uh, Virginia and um, Virginia Railroad Company and Truckee Railroad Company stock certificate. You can see it's 1869, signed by Sharon. 
this is the, the train. This is actually over Crown Point Ravine, which is no longer um, recognizable, but um, there was a, a, a ravine there and they built a trestle over to Virginia City from Gold Hill. And uh, the train went all the way through the town and stopped at all the mines. And you could see the ore cars from the mining mills up in Virginia City. And that was uh, a really great boon. And it was just in time for the big bonanza, which was in the mid 70s. And meanwhile, there was a, a law, uh, a mining law of 1872. And, and it, there were some laws put down. Uh, and and uh, by the way, uh, later on, Sharon had a lot to do with that when he became a senator. Uh, there were a lot of mining not innovations in the 70s during the big bonanza. Well, uh, one was uh, dynamite and uh, tamed Nobel's nitroglycerin. And then the compressed uh, air, burly drill. There's no more sl slamming sledgehammers and, and whatnot. This was a uh, compressed air drill. And uh, it, it was called a widow maker because it got raised a lot of dust and, and people, the miners got silicosis. They reduced that by putting a water spray in it. And um, here's a picture of one. And you can see the compressed air, there's water and uh, here's a drill. So you can see, the, by the way, you can see a blasting pattern on the uh, left here. Um, here's a, a man with a, a drill. It's a very heavy piece of operation it, it, uh, equipment, and it took three men typically to operate it. And uh, and this is one of the uh, Carson Mills. This is the Eureka Mill. This is the uh, Brunswick Mill, the interior. And this is the, the the main Bonanza King. This was a guy by the name of John Mackey who uh, the mining school over at UNR is named from. And uh, there was James Fair and uh, James Flood and uh, William O'Brien. O'Brien was a, a barkeep. Uh, Flood was more the financial guy. But James Fair was also uh, really involved in the mines and supervised them. Um, you can see this is Mackey's signature on the Hale and Norcross check. Um, here is the big bonanza in 72, but really 75, 76, 78, all the way through there. Uh, this was the big, this was the big find, but it was down deep at 1400 to 1550 feet. At, and uh, <coughs> they took out just a ton, 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 tons of ore from that. This is more of a, a, a picture. This is the consolidated in California shaft house. And uh, here's inside of it, the California pan mill, give you an idea. This, uh, now, the, you know, the Bonanza Kings got pretty wealthy from this real quick, from the original Gould and Curry, you can see James Fair's signature, but then he also signed, and this is the Pacific Mining and Milling Company. They actually did the same thing that Sharon did a decade earlier, bought out all the old mills and, and a couple of the mines and combined it into this. And they actually formed their own bank, the Nevada Bank. Um, th this, this was quite an operation. And even it extended into the 1880s. They, look at this Wells Fargo receipt for uh, the... Uh, 10 bars of bullion at $38,000. And where is it coming from? The Con Virginia and Mining Company, the big bonanza. This, the bars that they transported, by the way, were very big. They weighed over 100 pounds. Why? Well, it's kind of hard for, you know, horseback thieves to rob a Wells Fargo shipment and put a bar in each saddlebag and ride off into the distance. Uh, that'd be 200 pounds additional weight. 
Um, so they made these bars so that they couldn't really steal them on the way to San Francisco to the mint for coining. In all of this, uh, the assayer was a very important uh, person. He would grind some of the samples of the ore. He would actually test the ore so that the superintendent would know, well, should we go here or there? Where should we drill next? And what kind of returns are we going to get? Um, this is a picture of them uh, doing the, the assay, the fire assay, uh, to determine the gold and silver content. Um, it, but they very often would re receive amalgam mercury from a sample from the uh, mine, and they would distill off the mercury through the this distillation column and uh, get to recover the uh, gold and silver. You had to be very careful because mercury vapor is very poisonous. This is a uh, assay ingot by Harvey Harris from Gold Hill. Notice it's Nevada territory. This is before October, 1864. And uh, it has gold and silver in it, but it was, um, this is day to day, actually dated. Um, and Harvey Harris was a well-known uh, assayer, first in California and then later on in Gold Hill. Uh, this is uh, really interesting. I used to own this, I, I sold it to another collector, but this is a consolidated Virginia off assay office. And it's a punch that they use to punch the bars to identify them. Look at the other end of it, how smashed that is. Can you imagine how many bars that that actually smashed the, the logo into? I would like to have a few of them and, and hundreds of bars stand. And this is what the face looks like. It's, it's reversed and I did a a reverse so you could read it. So the Comstock load uh, was very large, $450 million in gold. I mean, in today's uh, prices, that'd be over almost $16 billion. Um, this equaled about a third of all the gold and silver found in the US. 80% of it came from the Comstock load and 40% of it came from the Con Virginia in California, the big bonanza. And the first three years uh, in, of the Big Bonanza, they produced about $3 million a month. So remember that multiply that by about 40 or 50 to get the value of uh, in cash today. So this was really, big, uh, this is incredible. Today, we only have the runes. This is the, the runes at the Charles Buttermill cyanide processing plant, which is down as you go down seven, seven Mile Canyon past the Gould and Curry site, this is the next site. And then the Donovan Mill, which is being restored, uh, re, uh, is in Silver City. And, another, and that used cyanide. That was one of the first ones to use cyanide. And the American Flat was a big operation later on in the 1920s. Uh, and that used cyanide also. So cyanide was another way of extracting gold out of the ore, and it was much more efficient, and it was lower cost, and of course it wasn't as poisonous uh, and environmentally damaging, which they didn't care about at that. This is a later picture of the, uh, the cyanide flat, and of course they tore it all down now because it was, uh, um, I, a problem, uh, a menace, uh, as they said. So the, the um, Dayton Dredge uh, was the next operation. And this was done also in the 20s. And this was actually right outside Dayton. If you go, if you turn up uh, one of the main streets there and you keep on going, you'll see a site that's fenced off. And it was where they put a big dredge in and they recovered a lot of gold. About $300,000 was recovered. <clears throat> this is uh, other discoveries in, and Reese River in Austin was one of the big ones for silver and very rich silver. And uh, Jacobsville, Clifton and Austin, they, they were all uh, near each other, Yankee Blade, Carson. 
And this is what it looked like back then. And today you can go up through Austin and see very, very, uh, very many of these piles or tail pile of tailings. Um, 19, this was done at about 1867. And um, this is one of the stock certificates, the New York Reefs and River Mining Company. A New York company basically bought up all the mines and put them the, together and operated them successfully for quite a number of years. Now, silver ores are really complicated. Some of them are very complicated, as you can see from this slide. Uh, ruby ore um, is a silver antimony, SB is antimony, S is sulfur, silver antimony sulfide, silver sulfide. This one is a silver copper antimony and arsenic sulfide complex. Then there's horn silver, which is just silver chloride and native silver. These two are easy to extract with mercury, but they be, become, these become very hard and you have to do more processing to them in order to extract uh, the ore. And the processing you had to do was uh, in order to get silver chloride, which you could extract with, with um, uh, mercury, you had to heat it up with salt, common table salt. And there was a uh, reverberatory furnace for roasting ore, and, but it wasn't hot, uh, very efficient. It, you would roast the ore with salt, and then you'd convert all these complex ores to, to uh, uh, silver chloride. Well, they, they basically uh, would have a, an operation crushing the ore, roasting it, and then into the pan process. Well, the uh, Stedfeld roasting surface, which was vertical, was a much faster and easier and cheaper way of doing it, of roasting these complex ores that they found in, in Nevada, all over Nevada, by the way. And when the railroad came in, they actually put an Auburn Mill company. By the way, this was right adjacent to the Nevada Historical Society. Uh, this mill was about a quarter mile away and uh, actually did the roasting of complex ores. This is an advertisement of that. And uh, <clears throat> the Manhattan Silver Mining Company was profitable because in the beginning, they found the surface ores, which were silver chloride or hornblende. And then down deeper, they were more complex, so they had to roast them. Um, this was a very successful mine. They had their own money. This is a $10 certificate for the miners. Uh, not too much of this was used. And um, here's a, a white pine. This is another mining area that was later found uh, halfway between Eureka and Eli, south of 50. And Treasure City was almost pure silver chloride, one silver. It ran $20,000 to the ton. I mean, it was incredible, but there wasn't much of it. And this is the town of Treasure City. It sits, by the way, at 9,000 feet altitude. Uh, got pretty snowy there in the winter. And this is one of the stock certificates from it, Monte Cristo Gold and Silver Mining Company. And this is what's left of the uh, town. I mean, this, this is about the only building that's left there on top of the mountain. Um, there was another uh, a mining boom in Eureka later on, Ruby Hill. And the, these are the uh, Eureka claims. This is a picture of Eureka uh, from the Richmond smelter. And smelting lead and silver and gold at Eureka was a completely different type of operation now. Well, they found that if you smelt, basically what you do is you heat up the ore, which is very highly concentrated in lead. And what happens is you oxidize this to an extent that all the all the ore, all the other elements form up a, a complex silicate, which rides up above the lead. And the lead is mel melted and it just drained off at the bottom and it contains the gold and silver. But you have to refine the gold and silver from the lead. And that's a separate operation. That was done, by the way, in the Bay Area. 
And this um, uh, gold and silver literally uh, was the big cash cow, but so was the lead. The lead was, of, of course, used for bullets, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you can see them uh, pouring off the lead silver from the smelting operation here. Now this required a lot of heat and they had to use charcoal. And basically what they did was they made charcoal in these ovens. These ovens are in several places in Nevada and um, they would uh, basically burn wood uh, and mesquite and whatnot uh, in these beehive kilns. And they'd hold about 50 cords of wood and, and they'd basically uh, uh, use that charcoal for the smelting process. Uh, the final refinery from lead, gold, silver bullion into gold and silver and lead was done by the Selby Smelting and Lead Company up in San Francisco. This is one of their uh, assay receipts. And you can see how much gold, lead, and silver. And then here's some of the stock certificates from Eureka. And here's the um, uh, operation at Eureka. You can see all of these are the old uh, uh, used crucibles. Here's another view of Eureka today. And this is Pioche, another very rich area, uh, which uh, uh, produced a lot of uh, wealth, about, uh, about $5 million in silver in, in just a few years, 69 through 1872. Um, Pioche was a bad town. Uh, there were 74 people buried in the cemetery before they buried anybody dying of natural causes. Uh, a bad town, badder than Bodie. Um, this is basically um, a, a loading um, operation from ore from the mine into uh, uh, a wagon, basically carrying it to the mill uh, from Pioche. <clears throat> this is one of the uh, other areas, Silver Peak and Red Mountain and uh, this is in Esmeralda County. This is the operation of uh, the Pittsburgh Silver Peak Gold Mining Company. Now we're getting towards the turn of the 20th century. $7 million came out of this operation. And by the way, there were a lot of them around the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Um, uh, Tonopah, Goldfield, Seven Troughs, whoops, um, uh, Rawhide, Rochester, Fairview, Wonder, Weepaw, Silver Peak, Candelaria, Eli, a lot of them. And, and Eli started copper. Well, that, uh, that is probably uh, the beginning of uh, copper mining, in, in, or real copper mining in Nevada. But a lot of the uh, big mining in this area really centered around Tonopah, and that was uh, basically silver mining. And uh, here's the, you can see all the claims around there. Here's a picture of the Belmont mine at Tonopah. And this is what it looks like today. Well, there was also Goldfield, which isn't too far away. And that was gold and a similar claim map. Look at, the, look at how many claims there were there. And Goldfield was a pretty big town then. And there was, I mean, you can see the size of it. And uh, there were plenty of uh, active mines. The jumbo mine was very, very profitable. They sacked the ore and brought it to the mill. Here's the Rochester mill. Um, here's, um, uh, during this period, um, we've got to look at some of the modern mining technology that came about. Candles went to carbide lamps in the 1890s, and then electric lights started around 1900. Um, for crushing the ore, they used ball and rod mills. So I'll show you a picture in a minute. And then froth flotation. They used to uh, separate particles of ore from the gang or the waste material 
or, or sometimes known as Baraska. And, and uh, this relied on that hydrophobicity uh, differences between minerals and waste rock and uh, increased by the use of surfactants and wetting agents. And then the open pit mine, which was in situ. In other words, you didn't bring the mine, you processed everything there. And uh, I'll show you some pictures of that. We'll go over that. Here's the uh, rod and mill. This is the rod crusher would rotate and it crushed the ore. This is uh, one with uh, balls. And um, the loaders were no longer shoveling ore. They'd use these to load them into ore cars. And they were electric power or co first compressed air and then electric power. Here's today uh, an electric engine that's pulling all the ore cars through the tunnel. So modern mining technology really um, came up with, it really started out with the leaching with cyanide, which as I said, was a, a lower cost way of extracting gold and silver. <clears throat> and it not only had uh, better efficiency, um, the, the old mercury you, you only used 60 to 70% recovery. So when cyanide came along, they went back through the dumps and they, they started going back through the ores and trying to reclaim uh, the poor uh, uh, or leftover uh, gold and silver. Uh, leaching with other chemicals uh, for uh, such as sulfic, sulfuric acid for copper uh, in the early days. And then, then one of the largest US precious metal heap leaches was the Round Mountain, Nevada operation. Um, that had over 150,000 tons per day of ore going to be crushed or, uh, or the run of mine, run of mine, they call it ROM heaps, at an average of only 0.55 grams of gold per ton. So this, is, this really could recover gold at very, very low concentrations. And <clears throat> this is what another open pit mine looks like. Um, Here's another one. And uh, you notice there's like roads here and there, you see that truck there? Well, that truck is this truck and, uh, and it's huge. And it weigh, it can carry a hundred to 350 tons. This is my granddaughter inside the tire of that truck. And she's a teenager there, believe it or not. And uh, the scoops that they used to uh, scoop up the ore and put it in the trucks. Uh, this is big Brutus. This is one of the biggest ones, about 350, 400 tons at a scoop. Now, the leach field was right there by the mine. What they would do is they piled up the ore, they, the, the waste rock in another place, but they piled up the ore and they'd put these tubes running all over and basically, they would let a, a dilute solution of um, uh, cyanide for copper or, or for uh, gold and silver. And then they do a very similar process for copper mining. And um, the Lyon County, uh, the, the, the first was in 1918, the Empire Nevada mine. And then uh, Nevada had only one copper mine in 1995. Uh, left. It was uh, the Arometco uh, MacArthur mine in Yarrington. Um, the, but Nevada had really been one of the largest. Here's the picture of the Liberty Pit mine at uh, B, the copper BHP Copper Company's Roger Robinson project at Eli, Nevada. Here's a Anaconda copper mine at Yarrington. It's obviously not active. And then, you know, they found uh, gold again in the 1930s. This was after uh, the uh, World War I. And they found this very finely divided gold. And it was known, later known as the Carlin type deposits. And the Carlin gold deposit discovery um, 
there was a, a guy that really assayed or he took drilling samples all over and he mapped out one of these and sold it. And it was really um, the uh, second only to the discovery of the Comstock in the importance of mining. Gold prices increased in, in 1933 with the Gold Act to $35 and to some 10 times that value by 2005. And of course, today it's closer to $2,000 a ton, or excuse me, an ounce. Um, so this was a big find and uh, a belt five by 40 miles northwest and southeast from the original discovery now is more than 20 miles. And it's one of the major producers. And today there's over 35 million troy ounces. Multiply that and you get $60 billion. These, these, this is a whole new way of mining. And what we have today is a whole series of these mines, Carlin type deposits all over Nevada. And uh, this is a list of some of them. And the interesting thing is that Nevada is really not now the silver state, it's really the gold state. In fact, there's more gold mined in Nevada than any place else in the United States. And it, it accounts for 80% uh, of all the gold in the United States. And that includes all the other mines in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Idaho, Montana, et cetera. Many of the early silver mining districts produced considerable quantities of gold also. Uh, the Comstock you know, is known for silver, but uh, there were 270 tons of gold through 1959 taken out of the Comstock. And in the Eureka district, they found uh, another 37 tons of gold. And that was, remember the lead ore that was smelted. And the Robinson copper mine, uh, well over 2.7 million troy ounces or 84 tons of gold, along with over 4 billion uh, pounds or a uh, million and a half tons of copper. So these mines were producing it as a byproduct. Today, the, um, the, uh, if you look at a map of Nevada, which is very uh, instructive, there's a lot of mountains, a lot of mountain ranges there, roughly north, south, and there's a lot of dry lake beds between the mountains. It used, these used to be inland seas and over 300 mountain ranges run uh, north and south in Nevada. It's one of the most mountainous states in the country. Well, guess what? They found something else in here. And one, uh, one of those is a company, a co I mean, a compound or compound, an element called lithium. Now, lithium, you may know from lithium batteries. And uh, Nevada is one of the uh, producers, the big producers, uh, and the only producer in, in the USA, and China, Australia, and, and Chile. But there are huge reserves in Nevada. And the question is, is it going to lead to another uh, mining boom in Nevada? Well, the lithium batteries are going into electric vehicles, and you know where that's headed. And they, these hydrothermal deposits are all over the place. But right now, the, uh, the initial mine is at U Silver Peak. We mentioned that before. Uh, it's operated by Abermel, and it extracts lithium from brine outside of Tonopah. So there's many others to be developed, but they're pending a lot of environmental hurdles. I mean, the cost of mining today, uh, just, just to go in and dig up any of, and, and start costs over a hundred million dollar investment. Now, lithium is really gonna grow. This is a projected uh, use of annual lithium battery demand, and you can see it's exponential here. So this is, two, this is here, us now, and uh, you can see where it goes by the end of the decade. And so lithium is not only the uh, uh, other element that's found in these lake beds, there's also rare earths. And these are used in 
catalytic converters, hybrid automotive batteries, wind turbines, LCD screens, electrical engines, medical imaging equipment. The rare earths are very important. China is one of the biggest uh, depositories of these, but uh, Nevada could be uh, mined to extract these. So <clears throat> in the future, there's that possibility. So that'll give you, um, that brings us up to today. And I wanna thank you for your attention. If you want some suggested reading, I would recommend these books and um, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Paul, that was great. It, it, you covered so much of Nevada's history and, and I know I, I was writing down a lot of facts, but also some questions as well. So let me look at our chat list. I see there's several questions. Um, all right, our first one. Uh, Linda had asked, where were the Multop, the hydraulic diggings that you had shown early on um, with- your Those were actually in California. Okay. The, they have done some hydraulic mining in Nevada, but the, the nature of the ore and the deposits don't lend themselves to it. Uh, but that was a technique used, for example, if you go up to the Malakoff diggings, uh, just above uh, Nevada City, uh, you can get a great, great example of that. But they were also used in, in some places in Nevada, in Nevada. Yeah, I know of least Round Mountain as being one of the places, yeah. but I, I'm not sure exactly where else. So Yeah, any place that there was um, a hydraulic mining, they, they could use that. But in the, that was in the earlier years. In the later years, they used these dredges that I showed uh, in, in Dayton, the dredge that was used there to recover over $300,000 worth of gold that the panning of the early prospectors never uh, claimed. Did they also dredge in um, Austin? I knew about Dayton in the 20s, but I know I've heard of at least one other Maybe it's they may have. Uh, yeah, I don't know about the later uh, okay. processing in in Austin. Uh, they it, they could have because the surface deposits in there were really horn blend uh, uh, silver and silver chloride. And you could recover that very easily. And uh, so, you know, that that kind of ore would lend itself to. Uh, hydraulic methods. But let me, if you have ever gone to Reese River and Austin, it, it, there's not much water there. <laughs> so uh, it would be hard to uh, harness the Reese River to use for, uh, for uh, hydraulic mining. Absolutely. Um, the next question is, uh, Lorraine asks, was a check that was the check written by Sharon, um, by Sharon to Sharon? Was it cashed? Could you tell um, on the check yeah, itself? He actually cashed okay. three of those. Um, okay. I have all three um, yeah. in my collection. <laughs> and uh, it, I was really surprised at that. And uh, he, would he took withdrawals, as did, by the way, uh, the other bank, the, the, the two guys that I showed you, which uh, was Ralston and Darius Ogden. And they, Darius Ogden uh, was a Sacramento banker, but he was also a director of the uh, Bank of California. And of course, Sharon was the chief guy at the Bank of California. They all owned the Union Mill and Mining Company, and they all tapped it for a lot of wealth. But uh, Sharon, owned, he, he owned the biggest piece of it. Okay, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, there is, I got another question. Uh, what were the black spots on the cross section map um, identifying the maps? Is that, was that the depth level on that? Yeah, you know, those, are, you know, those were the depths and the size of the stopes. A stope is the actual ore deposit that was mined. So that was the size, those black areas were the, and you, you could see the, how large the deposit was and also how deep it was and how depth, okay. how deep it went. Yeah, that was the actual ore. Wow. And a lot of, uh, by the way, a lot of those areas are filled in with those 
uh, uh, structure of wood, um, uh, like I said, they like Lincoln logs, <clears throat> square set lumbers. They from the uh, Lake Tahoe and 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 the western side of uh, the valley here. Okay. They were all under. Um, there. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, so then, there's another part to this question regarding the mining candles. What was um, eliminated to make it burn brighter? You had said with the. There oh was yeah, a there was a product from it. Yeah, there was a. Uh, what they did was they took a tallow, the the uh, animal fat, and they basically extracted glycerin. It's a it's a compound okay. of glycerin and uh, organic acids, uh, oleic okay. and stearic acid, and and they he purified it to the stearic acid, and that's why they call them stearic acid candles, <clears throat> and that burned with a nice bright long flame and it wasn't smoky that's what i've always wondered too because yeah. you know early on you know any wind or you know it's real faint and yeah. you know and if they can... you saw if you saw a steric uh candle it would be very very hard and dense also oh, okay a lot okay. more fuel there well that's good because i could just imagine how quick <laughs> they would go through if yeah. you were trying to actually work all right. Another question or a comment was uh, loved seeing um, Mackie's signature. And she was commenting just that, you know, she's seen researchers as well as writers, you know, definitely spell his name different ways through time. Um, oh, the the stock certificates, a few that you were, you know, showing during the presentation, um, were they traded in in for money or did the backside show when they were redeemed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> stock uh, in a mining uh, company was an open-ended investment. What do I mean by that? It yeah. meant that if the mine needed more money, mm -hmm. it could uh, basically call out for an assessment. And um, very often on the back of the uh, certificate, you can see the first assessment, the second assessment, third, is, and there's a stamp and that it was paid. Because in order to hold on to that stock, you had mm -hmm. to pay assessments as long as they were called for by the mining company. Now, okay. in the okay. case of the Bonanza, well, they didn't have assessments. They had dividends and they oh, paid okay. out dividends to the owner of the stocks. So the, uh, they, the, that's what traded the stock up. So, and one of the tricks that the Sharon was doing because he controlled all the mines early on, uh, he was basically telling the superintendent, oh, by the way, mix the ore with waste rock when it goes to the mill. Well, the mill, which he owned, would make more money because they process it, processed the uh, incoming material by the ton. And oh. they would make more money. But the problem is that a mine would declare, oh, we're not making money. We need an, an assessment. And then the stock price would dive down. They'd buy the stock, the bank, would buy the stock and then they tell the superintendent, okay, cut out the waste rock. And now all of a sudden the mine was in Bonanza and was declaring a dividend and the stock price would go up and they'd okay. sell. So they okay. were making Point. it on low, both making, yeah. End. yeah. Okay. That's wow. why Sharon is really, and he became our Senator, by the way. Yes. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, there is another question. So can you find precious and semi-precious gems um, within silver and gold mines or because of the rock structure or those kind of different locations? I know, you know, you can see it in like marble and other stuff, but um, that's kind yeah, of Yeah. Um, well, it depends on the semi-precious stones and where, and where they're found. They're found in different matrices uh, mm -hmm. of rock and... Um, I don't recall. There's a thing called ruby silver, which is really pretty. It's it's beautiful. Oh. It's red, and uh, it, it's a silver sulfide, and um, 
it, but I wouldn't call it, because it's soft, I wouldn't call it a semi-precious stone. Most of the semi-precious stone has have a hardness, a bore hardness of like six or more. And uh, this, this stuff is really soft. So I don't know that there's any specific precious stones found in the ore matrix. Um, quartz is found there. And okay. sometimes amethyst is found in quartz. Uh, so that would okay. be the only one that I could guess, but I don't know in particular, if there's a particular mine where they'd found amethyst within the uh, the uh, quartz ore structure. Okay, would what would what would you consider um, turquoise because of uh, turquoise is a different uh, turquoise is actually a hydrated uh, it means water uh, silicate and it's mainly found um, it's found in some locations in Nevada, very thin layers of it, and there's various mm -hmm. mines. In fact, one of the richest, uh, or the, one of the most valuable types of turquoise um, is, is, was a mine that petered out in uh, Nevada. But the, um, uh, most of the turquoise now is found either in South America or, uh, or ac actually some of the most beautiful stuff is in Australia. Okay, because I, I know like in Tonopah, they still have, you know, they're, the family is still mining turquoise and they even have a mine. Uh, yeah, there are uh, quite a few uh, turquoise deposits. Yeah, there. and in an Austin, but are you thinking of the one in Battle Mountain was the one you were kind of talking about? That uh, No, there there's one, uh, it's, it's a very, I'm trying to remember the name. It has a uh, spider webbing of black all over it. And oh, um, okay. Uh, uh, it's there was Pilot Mountain was one of them, but this one is a okay. different one, and I can't remember. Oh it's no really, worries, I just was curious. As yeah, a kind it's of really bad because my wife has uh, a piece of jewelry made out of it, and I can't recall it. <laughs> no worries, <laughs> <Old> no. <age. laughs> Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you know, it was just making me think about that. Um, all right, I have another question. You mentioned the golden curry. Is curry related to anybody in Yosemite Valley and is Gould related to the Goulds in the Modesto area? Mm. Well, Curry, uh, by the way, was the founder kind of, of Carson City. And uh, okay. he actually uh, initiated the whole project to, to build the Carson City Mint. Um, uh, I don't know his, his family tree beyond that, um, and Gould, I don't recall again his family tree, but um, they were they were both fairly early investors and early people in the Washoe area. And by the way, before the Comstock was called the Comstock, it was called the Washoe area. If you remember that one uh, ad that I showed for uh, processing ore in San Francisco, it said the Washoe ore, you know, on it. So the oh, was kind of like the Washoe, Washoe, area. Washoe kind of thing yeah. too. And, and by the way, there were mills outside of that area. There was a mill mm -hmm. up in, uh, uh, by 595 uh, in the Washoe area. And there was actually about three, four, five of them there. And uh, yeah. there was a, two towns there that don't exist now where the train yeah. used to come up. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to make sure I got everybody here. Oh, uh, a question is how can we contact Paul with questions? You're such an uh, amazing resource. And I know you've given program lectures. Oh, yeah. Well, places, uh, if, or... if there's anybody requesting my email, they, you can give it to, to them. Okay. All right. And yes, absolutely. People can get a hold of me through the Historic Society, and I'll be happy to forward that on to people. Um, also, from the library, they said Mining in Nevada book list. It, um, they're available at the Washoe County Library System, so they provided a link in the chat. And I just want to say thanks, Paul. It was great. So I learned quite a bit. And um, Neil, did you have any comments or? Well, I was or... just hanging on to uh, thank Paul because any time that you request something from him, he is more than able and anxious <laughs> to accommodate. <laughs> He's a, a just a real asset to the state of Nevada. 
Well, thank oh, you. Absolutely. I think that yeah. presentation was somewhat like drinking from the fire hose. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of information there. And uh, believe it or not, I went through about 170 slides. Yeah. You went through quite a bit, but you covered so much. And it, it, yeah. And it was well, it nice the condensed. The mining in Nevada is, mm -hmm. is really incredible. And um, it, it, a lot of people don't really realize it. And until they go out to one of these ghost towns, uh, Stan Pear's book, I think, uh, chronicles something like 230 of these uh, uh, mining towns and ghost towns. And they all were basically mining towns for months or a few years or maybe a decade. The interest in mining and the ghost towns and the rest of it stands sold up in the, what, 35 or 40,000 of, of, of those books, uh, the yeah. Nevada Ghost Towns and Mining Camps. Oh, yeah. he's in, in the last issue, he upgraded all of the maps and everything there in color, so it's really easy to, to find out where you want to go and uh, directions. They, to they are great. Home. I would recommend those to yeah. anybody because... His two books, one, the one with the maps and the yes, earlier happened. one, which I think it was his PhD thesis. It was his, uh, no, it's his master's. He master's doesn't have it. Yeah. We, uh, we talked exclusively about that one day. <laughs> it was, I mean, yeah. He wrote that years and years ago, but it has yeah. some great photographs and descriptions of all the ghost towns. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely one of our reference books that we use for people doing research. Sometimes you don't always know, you know, these little towns that have kind of come and gone real quickly. So it's it's still an amazing resource even to today. Yeah. So and, yeah. and he, he gives a talk every once in a while and he has a tremendous photograph collection. And what he's yeah. done is he's gone to all these towns and he's taken a picture of a particular view, which he has an old picture of. So he gives a before and today type yeah. of uh, comparison yeah. of all these ghost towns, which is amazing. I know he did that at an Ali presentation uh, once, and I saw that at the, uh, uh, what is it? The Candy Dance. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, in down in, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, down this way towards yeah. Gardnerville. Uh, I've, I've I, talked to. I've talked to Stan, and he would like to come on somewhere down the line. Good. Oh, that would be great. That'd and be good. Got, and he's got multiple uh, programs, so he doesn't have to. Oh, focus. yeah, he can probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if that's it, thank you so much, Paul. We so appreciate okay. it. And I just want to say thank you, of course, to everybody that's joined us today. And I'll send it back to Samantha and the library. And thank you guys so much for helping us promote Nevada history. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Sherry Hayes Zorn and Neil Cobb and Paul Franklin with the Nevada Historical Society and Russell, our Washoe County Library Tech Wizard for making this event possible today. If you'd like to see what's coming up, um, you can visit events.washoecountylibrary.us where you can also access our uh, virtual Explorer, which is a publication listing of all our virtual and in-person uh, events. All right, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Bye.